Welcome to another MBS Highway live monthly webinar series. I'm one of your hosts, Megan Anderson, and today we have a very special returning guest. We have Dr. Lacey Hunt. He's an internationally known and award-winning economist, author, and public speaker. He's the executive vice president and chief economist at Hoisington Investment Management Company, and he's the author of two books and numerous articles in leading magazines, periodicals, and scholarly journals like the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. And today, he is going to share his thoughts with us on inflation, recession, and where he sees the markets heading. Join me in welcoming Dr. Lacey Hunt. Uh, what a great introduction. <laughs> well, Lacey, I want to I want to add to that that uh, Lacey, I, I cherish the fact that you're a great personal friend and mentor to me and someone who has helped everyone here at MBS Highway with your wisdom on previous calls, getting us through that uh, tough COVID period where there was a lot of uncertainty and and really being the voice of reason for us. So we appreciate you more than you know. And you know, Lacey, uh, right before we started, you were mentioning that you were at the Fed. With some of those legendary names, you know, the the Arthur Burns, you're at the Fed with him. William McChesney Martin, you're at the Fed with him. So it's, it, you really have a level of experience that is just unmatched, besides being what I think you're the best bond fund manager on the planet. Uh, so so thank you for joining us. Yeah, well, uh, don't, don't say that. <laughs> don't mention what we do here because the SEC, I'm not, I'm not soliciting business here. <laughs> You're kind, too kind. Um, and speaking of which, you know what we're going to do? We're going to show because, you know, you, you, are, you, you do have a presentation for us, but we want to make sure that the first thing we do is we put up this disclaimer, right, Lacey? So, right, right. So, for this everyone to say, this is the result of the new new directive from the SEC that came in early November. And uh, this, we are not soliciting business. This is not advertising. If this is an educational event, there you go. Okay, <laughs> now that we got that out of the way. <laughs> So, Lacey, uh, where do we begin? We've got some slides that I know that you wanted to add. Any opening remarks? Should we go to the slides? We're going to have questions for you about the Fed, the direction of, of uh, long rates. Um, what are some of those headwinds? We're going to get to all those questions. What did you think of the last jobs report? Uh, inflation? What do you, we're going to yeah. get to that, but I know are you've got some slides first. Yeah, are we in a recession? Yeah, we're in a recession. Yeah, all those things. <laughs> um, but, but first, Lacey, would you want to have some opening remarks or go right to the slides? I, I want to. Uh, I want to proceed here in a way I've, I've sort of outlined it. I think, I hope people will, will find some value in it. And we're going to get to all your questions because your questions are the same ones I'm trying to answer. <laughs> so so here, here we go. So let's go to slide one here, Lacey. And uh, we're, we're going to, uh, let me just get this up here. Talk, well, what the heck? Sorry, Lacey. It's a little bit touchy want, on this. I want to do a little Volkernomics to start. Um, um, Volker, um, as we all recognize, is probably our greatest Federal Reserve Chairman by far. Uh, but he was also an outstanding economist and he had a, a great strategic view of the world. And um, basically his framework involved two concepts the need for central banks to key on inflation. And uh, second, for the, for the central banks to uh, execute their policy based upon the monetary model. And um, he, he, he does uh, this because of, uh, of his vast knowledge and understanding of these various forces. And in spite of the fact that he is well aware that the monetary model in the simplest version is not correct. Um, but that doesn't mean it should be thrown out. It just means that we have to take into consideration um, the, what the Fed can do with regard to monetary change and what the private economy can do. And that, that of course is the velocity of money. And so I'm going to look at both of those factors because they are very critical uh, to understand. Uh, to start with, I'm going to read uh, just a few brief passages uh, from Paul's book, which was 
published uh, in 2018, just shortly before he died. So it was his final word. And in, in paragraph one, uh, he says, a relationship between money and the price level is one of the oldest propositions in economics. And he goes on to tell you that he, he's aware how it developed from the work from Hume. Uh, and he then immediately says that, um, that Friedman's model, which became very successful when he was chairman of the Fed, uh, was overly simple. He makes that very clear. Um, that model is that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Um, and he goes on to say that the simplicity of that thesis helped provide a basis for presenting the new approach to the American people. In other words, that, that inflation is the critical key, that, that you really cannot solve a country's problems by inflation. Too many people are hurt uh, in an inflationary environment. Um, and then in paragraph three, he said that because of the understanding of this basic monetary model, uh, that we could not back away from the emphasis of restraining the growth in money supply with, without damaging our credibility that once lost would be hard to restore. And he used some nautical terms there uh, to over dramatize a bit. We were doomed to follow through, we were lashed to the mast of price stability, which, which of course the, the Fed veered away from uh, in 2020 and 2021. And paragraph four is the most important. And I'm gonna read it slowly and then I'm gonna discuss it. Did I realize at the time how high interest rates might go before we could claim success? No. From today's vantage point, and here's the critical question, was there a better path? And he says, not to my knowledge, not then or now. And, and earlier in the book, Volcker uh, writes that Friedman, that he was aware that Friedman had recanted on the underlying assumption of the inflation and, and money because that the velocity is not stable. Um, but he still goes on to say, even with that knowledge, that, that the velocity pattern had changed, it's still the best model. So let's, let's go to page two and contrast uh, Volcker um, with, with the current Fed chairman on these two critical uh, issues, inflation and the role of money. Um, here on inflation, um, Powell seems to be clearly aligned uh, with Volcker. And I wanna read this brief passage in paragraph two from Jackson Hole, which, which is, is probably the most important lesson that I'm gonna give you today. He says, without price stability, the economy does not work for anyone. Without price stability, we will not achieve a sustained period of strong labor market conditions that benefit all. The burdens of inflation fall heaviest on those who are least able to bear them. So with regard to inflation, Powell and Volcker, same, same side. However, the role of money, there is a major divergence. In, in a discussion with, with Senator Kennedy of Louisiana in uh, 2021, congressional hearings, um, after Senator Kennedy questions um, Powell's forecast that inflation is transitory and not a problem, he, re he responds, and I'm gonna read what he said. When you and I studied economics a million years ago, M2 and monetary aggregates seem to have a good relationship to economic growth. Right now, M2 does not really have important implications. It is something we have to unlearn, our, I guess. And this has led to a, a very dramatic uh, policy era in 2021. And that policy era quite likely is setting up another policy era as the Fed tries to clean up the problem that they themselves in conjunction with fiscal policy created. Let's go to page number three. Now we're gonna look at um, uh, M2, uh, which is the most commonly measured uh, use of, velocity, of money for low liquidity. Um, the, the thick line is a, a superior measure for M2. It's called other deposit liabilities. It's, it's almost three quarters, 80% of M2. 
Um, the, the, the thing that caused me to switch to ODL is the Fed quit publishing uh, weekly money supply statistics. And I wanted to be able uh, to track what was going on weekly, but, but we can take this from the Fed's H8 release, which, which comes out weekly. Um, the difference between ODL and M2 is that M2 includes currency and money market um, mutual fund deposits uh, or shares. Uh, but, but really, a currency is clearly a medium of exchange and store of value unit of account, but it, it's not a universal medium of exchange or store of value. Currency is very difficult to store um, uh, uh, for a variety of reasons. More and more uh, businesses of all types are requiring either debit cards or credit cards. They, you, it's more, more difficult to use cash. And cash can't be used for large transactions. Storage is clearly a problem. Uh, money market mutual funds have some um, medium of exchange characteristics, but they only finance a small portion of the market. The other beauty of ODL is that it is the main source of funding for bank assets and liabilities. So in ODL, what we have is a monetary aggregate and a credit aggregate uh, combined in one. Now let's look at the chart. And first of all, notice uh, the uh, unprecedented growth uh, in liquidity that occurred in 20 and 21, that second circle. Um, now, Friedman's basic point is that the acceleration from the trough, uh, the, go to the first, uh, yeah. So uh, prior to the pandemic, we were growing around 3%, and then we accelerate up there. Uh, we have two years of almost 20% growth. Um, now, Friedman's point uh, was that the degree of acceleration determines the degree to which inflation overheats in an expansion. That's his point. And that the degree of deceleration from the peak, and see how we're, get, we're getting an unprecedented deceleration now, then that lays the foundation either for a protracted and shallow recession are a short and deep recession. In other words, when, when the Federal Reserve allows these types of swings, they boom the booms and slump the slumps. And that, that's precisely why uh, Friedman, as well as uh, Professor Taylor at Stanford, have said that, that the Fed needs to pay more attention to these matters and why they advocated rules rather than full discretion. Now, I want, uh, Barry, you to put your cursor on those two monetary spikes in the early 70s and the mid 70s. And uh, they, they weren't quite as high, but the, the real problem was that the Fed um, never uh, reversed them adequately until the early 1980s. And, and therefore the monetary growth, even though they, they gave lip service to containing it, uh, was never really effective until Volcker came to the fore. And, and let's look at this in another perspective on the next chart. And here what we're doing, the, the black line uh, is the velocity of, of ODL. And the blue line, which is plotted on the right axis, is the three-year rate of growth. And let's look at the blue line um, and notice that the, the three-year rate of growth never uh, gets into those two parallel bars uh, that are plotted from the 50s to the early 80s. Now, those two parallel bars are what Friedman described the optimum quantity of money, uh, which was based upon um, the country's production function. In other words, um, it, it looks at per capita uh, real GDP in terms of technological change and the factors of production, land, labor, and capital, plus 2% for, for price increases. And, and, and it wasn't really until the late 1980s when the Fed finally reversed those, those monetary mountains of the early 1970s. Um, but notice the, the black line, velocity. Uh, during the 80s, uh, there was a few. There were a few wiggles. I mean, the 70s, 60s, 70s, and early 80s. There were a few wiggles, but for all practical purposes, they don't mean that much, uh, and they were largely self-reversing. Um, and so, when Volcker was chairman of the Fed, uh, the the fact that 
uh, he was using the simple monetary model, didn't matter because velocity was stable. Now let's go to the far right hand of the graph. And uh, you notice that, that we're projecting that um, the, the three-year rate of growth is gonna be coming down very, very sharply. But notice what's happened to velocity. It's slumped very dramatically. It's, it's turned up uh, in the last quarter. But in my opinion, that's get on the black line there, Barry. Um, it's, it's come up a little bit if you look at the quarterly pattern this year. But for reasons that I'm going to discuss, velocity is more likely to be trending lower over the next several years than moving higher. Let's go to page number five. Um, <clears throat> these are the two main determinants of velocity. Velocity is an endogenous variable. Um, it's outside the Fed's control. And what it mainly depends upon is the productivity of our debt uh, and the loan to deposit ratio. And, and notice what's happening. We're, we're only generating now about 35 cents of GDP for every dollar of debt. Uh, there's been a little cyclical upturn this year, which is inconsequential. Uh, in my view, that will turn back down as the recession hits. And the same is true for the loan to deposit ratio, which is the inset chart. Uh, there are many other idiosyncratic factors uh, that influence velocity, too many to mention. But, but these are the two prime movers, and, and the upturn this year is, in my view, totally inconsequential and likely to be reversed going forward, which means that when you take into account what the Fed has done and what, what they're likely to do, uh, this, this liquidity mountain of 2020 and 2021 is, is, is largely going to be sufficiently erased uh, by the end of the first quarter or the early part of the second quarter. Let's go to the next chart. Uh, the, the, the critical line here is total reserves. Uh, before the, when the pandemic hit, uh, we had 1.7 trillion uh, in 2019, line number one. Uh, we went up to a peak of, uh, of 4.2 trillion in 2022. The, the, the weekly peak was around 4.3 trillion. Uh, right now, we're around 3.1 trillion, and if the Fed stays on target with their quantitative tightening, uh, and also the Fed funds increases that were in their September dot plots, uh, 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 total reserves will be about a trillion dollars lower by late in the first quarter, early in the second quarter, and in my opinion, at that point in time, uh, money adjusted for velocity will be in the non-inflationary range. Whether inflation gets back to the Fed's target then is a little bit problematical, but the Fed will have done, given the fact that it's a leading uh, component of the economy, the Fed will have done what is necessary to restore the price stability. Let's go on uh, to the next chart. Um, this is very critical and uh, it, it, it shows that, that in inflation is really the key variable that our people do not uh, do well in inflation. Um, the, uh, the black line is a survey, uh, the weekly survey, the established from the establishment survey, covers 77 million workers, goes back to 65. Uh, the, the thick line is, uh, is, uh, is available with a lag, but it, it covers about 116 uh, million full-time salaried and uh, hourly workers. Uh, notice where we are. Um, we're negative, uh, uh, you know, in the three to four percent range. We've been coming up a little bit as the inflation rate uh, has come down. Uh, this is the worst Christ of cost of living crisis since the early 1980s uh, by the broader series uh, and the worst cost of living increase uh, since 65 for the uh, narrower series. We have 70 million retirees, 60 million of them uh, historically uh, have done very poorly in high inflation. And, and so basically what has happened to 180 million Americans is that they've experienced a 4% loss in their standard of living. Um, inflation just doesn't work for us. It doesn't work uh, for the credit markets a longer term, doesn't work for the mortgage market, and it doesn't work for the majority of our people. It's a false notion uh, that, we can, uh, that we can do better. Uh, somehow in a high inflationary environment. Let's go to the next page. Um, this is uh, the broadest measure of income, which includes everything else, salaries, wages, proprietors' income. The red line is the trend that was in place before the pandemic. Those two spikes 
uh, were the combined uh, Federal Reserve uh, and fiscal policy operations. That those spikes are transitory income. They're not permanent income. And there's a big difference. Uh, but, but notice where we are now. Um, we are uh, substantially below uh, and the trend is, is down. And move on to page number nine. Um, in this high inflationary environment, uh, people have to try to survive. The inflation is in basic, uh, what we call uh, uh, non-elastic, inelastic goods. There are, no, there are no good substitutes for food, uh, fuel and shelter. People have to buy them. Uh, and, and to make ends meet uh, from paycheck to paycheck, we've seen a massive leveraging of the balance sheet. Uh, the saving rate uh, has been reduced to the lowest point since 2005. But look back to the left there. Um, there's a few months when the saving rate's been lower than it is now, but to get any sort of protracted period of weakness is back during the Great Depression. Uh, look at the debt, uh, household debt to disposable income. Um, we, we, we were deleveraging there prior to the pandemic, which was a good thing for the economy, but, but that, that uh, process has been reversed and we're back where we were in 2018. And uh, I think that uh, the drop in the savings rate, the drop, a rise in this ratio are, are indication that we're gonna see increasing delinquencies, which we're starting to see, not just on some of the uh, subprime automobile loans, but in, in, in broader, higher qu quality credit measures as well. Let's go on to the next chart. Uh, the, there are a lot of different uh, consumer sentiment measures, but, but in my opinion, Michigan has it right. Uh, look at the, the uh, line with the arrows there in the, up against the right-hand side where I've got a chart. Um, notice that when, when the transitory income increased during the pandemic, Michigan never recorded a rebound to pre-recessionary level, pre-pandemic levels. And that's because people are able to differentiate between permanent income and transitory income. And now there's been a collapse. And as you can see, we're at recessionary levels and we're below where we entered all of the post-war recessions going back to 53. Just, just to clarify for everybody, permanent income, you got to raise, transitory income, you got to stimmy check. Well, and, and it's also, um, uh, Modigliani uh, used a different term, like life cycle. In other words, people make a, an assessment of not only what they're going to be able to earn from the paycheck and other sources uh, now, but in the future. And, and so Friedman's permanent income hypothesis and Modigliani's life cycle hypothesis are the same. And in my opinion, that's the way to look at it, Barry. Great question. Let's go on to page 11. some pre-recessionary indicators. I'm not gonna go through them, but I, I think that um, two is, is worth mentioning. We're seeing across the board declines in all type of freight. There's an old adage, they don't sell, they don't ship what they don't sell. And we're seeing pricing there weakening. Let's go on to page 12. Um, the manufacturing sector, which is your high multiplier, uh, it's only 12% of the economy. I realize that by employment, but on a value added basis, it's 20%. Um, look at the latest readings there. You can see it's at a recessionary reading, uh, a major fall off. The level is even lower in Europe and Japan. Let's go on to the next chart. Uh, when, when the Fed uh, went on the money bench in 20 and 21, um, firms were pursuing, um, let's page, page 13 there. Um, we're pursuing just in time. Now they've gone to just in case, and there's been a, a, a major acceleration in inventory growth, even more so in Europe. Let's move to page 14. So we were not equipped for the supply side shortages. Let's look at page 14. Uh, the inventory investment in the, the broadest measure has recovered. Uh, in fact, I think what we're going to soon find out is that the inventories are high and they're going to have to be liquidated. Let's move to page 15. Uh, here is uh, your critical leading indicator from the manufacturing sector, uh, the backlog of unfilled orders. Uh, it's, 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 it's a good proxy for supply side disruptions. Uh, there, there's no order backlog right now. We're not as low as we went during the pandemic, but we are back in the range of the uh, recession, the great financial crisis and also the recession of 2000 clearly a dramatic change. We had the supply side disruptions, uh, but they are, they're reversed. The, 
the and the liquidity mountain is is in the process of being reversed. Let's go to the if next. I may, if I may just add, because we're all concerned about inflation, so this would appear to me to be pretty much a deflationary indicator, since a, if you have a lot of if you have a lot of stuff that's on the shelves, you're going to have some discounting. Well said, Barry. Well said. Let's go to the next chart. Uh, here is your supplier deliveries, the, long, the length of time it takes before you have something delivered. Um, notice what happened there between the monetary surge and the supply side disruptions. We went up to unprecedented levels, uh, but we've reversed. Uh, we're we're uh, through the pandemic lows, uh, and uh, we're back at levels that we haven't seen very often. We did we saw them more distressed during the great financial crisis, but not as distressed uh, in the two previous recessions. Let's move on to page 17. Uh, another factor that's changing, um, the uh, non petroleum uh, import prices surged, uh, but now they're declining. Uh, and this, this reflects uh, the dollar's gain, but it also reflects uh, that demand is weakening in the United States, Europe. The European Union says Europe is in a recession, uh, I don't know exactly how to phrase what Japan and China are in, but they're in bad shape. Let's go to the next chart. Um, the housing sector is a compelling uh, indication of economic deterioration. Let's go to the next chart. This is very important. Um, the NBER stands for National Bureau of Economic Research. Uh, it's our most prestigious source of business cycle knowledge. Um, it's those folks that, de uh, that indicate when we're in recession or expansion. Um, uh, they, they key off of the seven indicators here. Uh, some people think it's four. No, they changed that a couple of years ago. Let's look at them for just a minute. Um, uh, the ones that are red means that they're in a decline mode already. Uh, so four of the measures are declining, three are still rising, which means that we haven't tipped into recession, but the momentum is there. Um, let me uh, have you look at line one and then line five. This is uh, line one is your payroll establishment survey, which the, the, the bond markets key off of. But look at line five. Go to line five household employment. The National Bureau has studied each of the two series very extensively. And what they found is that it's not clear which is superior. So they give both of them equal weight. Um, and, and right now we're seeing a major uh, divergence. Uh, the household employment in the last two months has, has, has dropped about four and two thirds um, Four and two, uh, 460, 470,000. Um, since uh, the spring, the line number one is up 2.7 million, but your household employment is only up 12, 10 or 12,000, a major divergence. Um, and and uh, if, you, if you do look at the full cycle, both expansions and recessions, you'll, you'll see that sometimes one is superior than the other. But for my money, uh, I believe that as you're going into recessions, early stage recessions, the household measure is a superior to the establishment measure. Uh, line number two, um, your real personal income less transfer payments peaked late last year. It's negative. Industrial production has come off a little bit. Manufacturing and trade sales have come off. Uh, line number six, uh, personal consumption expenditures uh, have just set a new peak. Some people characterize the consumer as strong. I would not use that word. Uh, when you have to rely heavily on leveraging the balance sheet, drawing down the saving rate uh, to sustain your daily living, that is not a strong consumer. Uh, it's a consumer that's living on borrowed time. And uh, so even though the personal consumption is, is the biggest component of our economy, it's the one that I think that is very susceptible to deterioration. And let's go to the last line, line number well, seven. You know, you know what, Lacey, that, that you just made a couple, This everything that you're dropping here is just such amazing information and knowledge, but 
There's a couple of things I just want to make sure everybody caught. Okay. So, you know, you hear it every day on CNBC a hundred times. Well, the economy is so strong. The consumer is so strong. Lacey's underscoring that that strength is coming from the huge increase we've seen in credit cards. That's what he means when he says you're leveraging the balance sheet. People are borrowing it. So they're going into further debt to keep their lifestyle, but not just the further debt, the drawdown of their savings to keep that lifestyle. Evidently, they may have gotten accustomed to the lifestyle that they've had in the past two years, and they're not letting go of that as easily by making cutbacks. They're just drawing down on savings and increasing debt. Certainly, it's a difficult situation for people, but this is something that 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 we are looking deeper at and, and certainly challenging a lot of these views that people are inc clearly incorrectly saying that, oh, the economy is so strong, how can we have a recession? And somebody else mentioned something too about, you know, how does this affect housing? We'll get into that. Don't worry. I know somebody said, well, there's bad news. It, it could be good news for interest rates and not bad news for housing. So Lacey's giving you an overview. And the other thing that you should note that Lacey said was kind of what we told you in the update after we uh, dissected the jobs numbers. And that was, was that it was a grand illusion because inflection points, as we talked about and went a little deeper with that, uh, the, the, the birth death ratio, it has a very hard time in the modeling capturing the changes. When we had John Walden on yesterday, he talked about that, and Lacey's underscoring it here. So you can see that's why you hear us talk about the household survey. Nobody else really talks about that on TV, but we go deep on that stuff, and we also like the ADP report. But sorry, Lacey, I just wanted to underscore those things. For I'm everybody. glad you did, and it, it's very well said. I, I, would, I just don't like to make two little footnotes uh, to uh, reinforce what you said, Barry. Uh, the, univer the University of Michigan, who does the sampling correctly, focusing off of the key thing, inflation and real income, reflects the pressure that households are under. And it reflects it very, very clearly. Um, in addition, um, the, uh, the, the, the establishment survey, which is a very limited sample, um, is really the, the, the total data comes from what we call the quarterly census of employment and wages. And um, this survey comes out with a lag, but the, the BLS and uh, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, they have the revisions for the third quarter. And there was a 50 basis point reduction uh, in private payroll employment uh, with the QCEW data. And in fact, it led to a, a uh, $50 billion reduction in wage and salary income for the third quarter, largely ignored. Um, and um, in, in addition to that, uh, in the numbers out this morning, uh, the, comp the compensation for the third quarter was lowered, also reflecting the QCEW. So the, the problem here is that the, this establishment survey is lagging what other uh, less well-known sources of government data are telling us, that the labor markets are softening. Uh, now let's pay attention to pay, line number seven. Um, the, the NBER does not use GDP. They use the average of, of gross domestic income and GDP. Now in economics, we have something called the circular flow. What we earn equals what we spend equals what we produce. Uh, but they're, they're different data sources and they, they constantly diverge. And, and so um, the NBER, when they look at these deviations, it's, it's like uh, the employment measures. They can't determine which is superior. And so rather than relying on one, they average GDI and GDP. And let's go to the next chart. And here we show the average. And as you can see, it's basically flat. Uh, if you look at the numbers there uh, at the bottom of the page um, uh, and looking at the average for 2022, there, we had two out of the three quarters negative in GDP, one out of the three quarters negative for GDI. But for the year, we're only growing 17 basis points at a 0.17% annual rate. That's basically flat. And um, it, 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 it's confirmation that the economy is already in a stationary mode based upon the broadest measure of economic behavior. Let's go to 20, page 21. Um, here is productivity with aggregate demand flat, and they were adding employees in the first part of the year. Uh, productivity dropped it just like it did there 
uh, in 74 and 75. We'd been through a period of labor shortage. Uh, demand flattened out. The firms kept hiring, um, hoarding labor, uh, but their productivity was hit. But look, look at the productivity graph there on the right-hand side. Notice what happened in the third quarter. Starting to improve. Well, that's a good thing for inflation, but it's also an indication that firms are starting to cut costs and in increase efficiencies. And we're, we're seeing signs of layoffs even, uh, and it's not just the high tech sector or the non-store retailers or transportation firms, it's beginning to spread um, in, to Wall Street and also to in the durable goods sector. But, but that's a, a significant change. Let's go to the next uh, chart. Um, this is the relationship between CEO uh, confidence from the conference board uh, and, and corporate profits year over year. Uh, they're, they basically move together, but the, the good thing about the, the conference board survey is that we already know that number for the fourth quarter. Um, it's already been surveyed, which would be consistent with a 20% decline in corporate profits next year. Let's go to the next chart. This is an important leading economic indicator. It's the spread between the two-year note, the 10-year note and the two-year. Uh, earlier this morning, I checked it. We were at 80 basis points, uh, which means that we're deeper than where we were in, in 2019. The first arrow there, yeah. Deeper than we were prior to the great financial crisis, deeper than prior to the, 20, the 2000 recession and 1990 recession. Uh, in my opinion, uh, this, is, this is not a perfect indicator, but it is a very good one. And it's a reflection of the monetary restraint that's underway. But it also, in my opinion, at least, it serves to reinforce the restraint because it makes uh, borrowing short and lending long less profitable or unprofitable, depending upon the case may be. This is a worthwhile variable. Uh, and uh, 80, point, 80 basis point uh, inversion here is, in my view, very significant. Let's move on to the next page. Um, in, the, in the third quarter, uh, we, we, we had a 3% rate of growth, looks very robust, but all the growth is the is result of this um, uh, in, uh, lesser uh, net export deficit. Um, uh, the, the improvement is real. Uh, firms cut back on their ordering from overseas because they had too many inventories. Uh, but, but this improvement is not gonna be sustained uh, because business conditions are terrible around the rest of the world. Uh, and even though the dollar is, is now starting to come off, it's still extremely higher than it has been. And, and so this improvement in the trade deficit, um, in my view, will be reversed. It doesn't mean it'll all be reversed this quarter or the next quarter, uh, but this big surge that we had here, uh, the more important development for me is what's happening to our exports. Exports are one of our highest multiplier sectors. And we've now had seven consecutive monthly decline in real exports. And, and that's an indication of a problem for them. And also it's a problem for us. Let's go to the next chart. Uh, here's your trade weighted dollar. Um, the, um, from the low point 10 years ago, we were up almost 45%, very substantial move. Notice though the little trend up there, the go right, yeah, you see that? Uh, in my opinion, that's a confirmation that this market sees the same thing the commodities and the treasury market sees, that economic activity is weakened. And the, the, the dollar weakness in here is not gonna alter the fundamental picture, but it, 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 it is going to um, be consistent with uh, with what is needed for the world in order to eventually have a recovery. Now, normally when the dollar rises, the inflation rate falls because you know um, we sell fewer goods overseas, we import less. Uh, the current environment has been very, very difficult because uh, the Bank of Japan and the People's Bank of China, uh, their currencies were in terrible shape and they, they had to sell a lot of treasury. Look at the text there. Uh, in the right hand at the bottom of the page. Um, uh, from so far this year, the treasury holdings of the foreign sector have dropped about 450 billion and in Asia alone, 452 billion. And the main reason for this was the heavy selling of treasuries 
uh, by the Japanese and, and Chinese central banks in order to get funds to try to pop up their currencies. But, but this environment uh, is changing and it's a reflection of, of a poor economic conditions, but better conditions than the bond market in my opinion. Here's another lead, this is the index of leading economic indicators. Uh, we've declined every month since February. Um, uh, the LEI leads recessions by about 10 to 11 months. So the peak was in February. Based on the LEI, the recession should be starting around the turn of the year, maybe a little sooner, maybe a little later. Um, look at the six month rate of change. Uh, we're, we're getting a very steep decline now at a 5% annual rate. That doesn't happen uh, without a recession, in my opinion. Let's go on to page number 27. This is um, the performance of our standard of living real per capita GDP. Uh, notice we were diverging from our longtime trend uh, growth prior to the pandemic. Uh, we were in 2019, we were $10,580 below the blue line, and we're now almost 13,000 below. The critical thing is the inset um, the real per capita income measured in constant U.S. dollars 2010, which eliminates the main distortions, our per capita income is now 38% higher than in Europe. It's an indication of how weak they are, and we're about 20% higher than in Japan. Uh, so we're weakening now, and the markets are aware of that, but the fact of the matter is we're probably going to end up still stronger than the rest. But, but this weakness is playing in the, uh, the reversal of the dollar that we've been seeing here uh, since the early part of October. The next chart, um, the federal debt level, um, uh, we surged during the pandemic. We had this surge in transitory income. We've come off a little bit, but when the recession hits, this ratio goes up. Now, the reason that I put this in, in it, it's very, very critical because uh, once the inflation is contained, in my view, we're going to be facing all of the problems of excessive over indebtedness and the debt overhang and the debt trap. And uh, I believe that the debt will then reassert itself uh, as a drag on both economic growth and inflation and will, will be more conducive to a low interest rate environment, not a high interest rate environment. Let's go on to the final chart. Uh, this is the long-term treasury rate uh, going back more than 100 years, 1870. Uh, I want to draw your attention to these, these dots, uh, 1966, 1970, 1971, 1973, 1980. Um, and um, what these dots have in commonality is that we had an inflationary problem. Money started accelerating. It moved to higher prices. The Federal Reserve acted to contain the problem, but they didn't get the job done. And so what, when, when William Martin moved against the Vietnam War inflation in 1966, it wasn't sufficient. And it allowed what I would call, and hear me uh, on this point because they wanna make it as clear as possible. What evolved was a money price wage spiral. In other words, the inflationary process went long enough that it, it, it infected the wage bargain. And uh, there was a repeat in 1970 by Martin, carried on by Burns. Uh, there, was a inter, there was a combined monetary and fiscal policy operation in 71. It was widely hailed at the time, uh, but it sent inflation off. It led to that monetary surge. Uh, we took deep recession in 70. Uh, two in uh, 73 and 74, uh, but the Fed never really contained the monetary growth. Uh, and, and so uh, we were constantly on this roller coaster of a money price wage spiral. Um, so we then fast forward to 2021. We have another combined monetary and fiscal policy operation. Keep in mind that the Federal Reserve Act was designed to have the Federal Reserve be independent, to not be tied up. Um, when things went wrong with the Nixon program in 71, which the Fed bought into 100%, uh, and, and the problems were evident, the fiscal policy um, was absent. And so monetary policy had to try to clean up the mess. The same thing happened now. So my concluding note is that 
for the time being, I think we can assume that the Federal Reserve is going to reverse the, the liquidity mountain that they created. Now, the, the other possibility is that they um, pull up too soon or um, reverse themselves in some dramatic fashion. Uh, the, the, the problem with that is, is that it would perpetuate uh, this incipient money price wage power. But for the time being, uh, in my opinion, uh, the direction of the long-term treasury yields is lower and perhaps significantly so. Barry, that concludes my remarks. Wow, I just want to say we went through a lot of stuff right there. Before we open it up into the discussion and the questions that we want to ask you, we have had a lot of people in the chat box ask for these slides, and Lacey was kind enough to share the slides. So in the email that's going to be sent out afterwards, there will be the slides included. So you will be yeah, getting well, 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 we could post those, Megan, and people just go to the site for the post. That'll be easy. Um, but we, we will send a notification saying it's there for sure. Uh, so, so Lacey, just I don't even know where to begin. That was that was amazing. Um, inflation uh, looks to us like it's coming down. You know, you and I have talked about this offline. You know, we talked about housing coming down and and money supply coming down. Uh, what what do you think about um, the first quarter, first half of next year, as far as where we can expect somewhere of the inflation rate to be, let's say core CPI, take take that one or or whatever you prefer. And then what do you think that means for the 10-year treasury yield? Well, it, it, just to, to sort of recapsulize what I said, I, I think that the huge liquidity mountain will be contained um, if, if the Fed does their 96 billion per month of QT. And uh, they go through with the federal funds regime as they outlined in the September minutes, which would be 50 basis points in December and 25 in February. Um, in my opinion, the reserves will be sufficiently lower at that time. And um, the monetary damage will have been contained. Uh, the supply side is, is healed, in my view. So really the only, only piece left is to, to, to bring liquidity into, a, um, into the necessary range. Um, so the, we have to keep in mind that, that, that inflation lags the monetary change. Um, but I, I think that um, with a, a couple of, of possible breaks, um, the, the, the Fed could be back close to their target by the end of next year. They'll, they'll have sufficient restraint in the system um, by, by, by the end of the first quarter. And they will have stopped uh, raising the federal funds rate. And I, I think that um, the next major move, I don't want to pinpoint it, but it will be downward, not upward. We're, we're in the last stages of federal funds rate increases. So, I know people will want to know this. They'll want to cut to the trace. What does that mean for more? Could, could, I, could I just make one other point before I don't, I don't want to interrupt you, my good friend? Um, I don't think that the, the federal funds increases here are going to deter the bond market, the long end of the treasury market. I think the yield curve will continue to steepen. Um, to, to me, the, these signs are fairly strong. And I, I don't survey, I don't call people and talk to them, but I think, I think that, that they, the evidence, is, as you've concluded, and as I've concluded, is becoming increasingly clear that the economic prospects of the country are not good. And um, so the, the process is in, uh, underway. Uh, at some point, the, the Fed will do a pivot. I don't consider raising the federal funds rate 50 basis points to be a non-pivot, <laughs> even though it's a smaller increase. But the, the Fed is getting the job done, whether they um, pull up or reverse themselves too quickly and perpetuate uh, that the, the wages becoming infected here. Um, that, that may come into play, but that's not my focus for the time being. My focus is on the unfolding recessionary possibilities. So a couple of things just so everyone should know. So Lacey and I talked before this. He doesn't want to give an opinion on things like housing or on mortgage rates, but we can tell you this. 
and and you know we've we've shown this in the updates. There's been a 35 year history that while it's not in lockstep by any stretch of the imagination, the relationship between mortgage rates and the 10 year Treasury has been 175 to 200 basis point spread. That has gotten abnormally large. We thought it would come down. The reason why it's gotten abnormally large is because the servicing value has been sucked out of mortgage backed security pricing because the experts, the smartest money in the world, believe the same thing that these loans will be refinanced and the servicing will not occur for years, but rather months. And therefore there's very little servicing stream of revenue. So that's hurting the value of mortgages. Now, as the 10 year treasury comes down, which Lacey has told us, he thinks that there's a good probability of, you know, we told you we thought we were getting to 3%. I know a lot of people didn't believe that when it was four and a quarter, but here we are less than a month later and you're looking at three forties on the 10 year. It's not gonna be in one step, but we think 3%, maybe lower than 3% by first, second quarter is very likely in our humble opinion. That means mortgage rates not only come down, but they accelerate faster as they have been. They've been coming down faster than the 10-year treasury because servicing value starts to get added back in. So we think that around 5% is right. And you should also know that Lacey's thinking about recession. Mortgage rates do very well during recessions. History shows that mortgage rates come down during these periods. And the big key for us to remember is that contrary to what the media says, the facts are that real estate does well during recessions as well. So you know, there was only one time and there was different reasons. There was demographic reasons for that. If you've heard me speak, you know that we break this down. But I want you to know that you know while we're talking about things that sound like, okay, there's some struggles in the economy and we get that, you will see it bounce, okay? But these struggles in the economy return us to a normal trend, which was down in rate, healthy for housing, things of that nature. So you pick the right business to be in. So sorry, Lacey, I just wanted to give kind of a, a quick recap. Now I've got a couple- Could I, of just, could I just add one thing? As yes. an economy, I consider housing to be a counter-cyclical indicator. There you go. There you <laughs> go. exactly what you said, but with the fancy words. <laughs> I, have a question on, I have a question on recession. You know, a question that I get oftentimes, and it has to do with the two consecutive quarters of negative GDP that we've seen. And, you know, you've heard that being a, a kind of Wall Street rule of thumb. So my question is, is has the NBER changed the goalpost a bit? Have they always averaged GDI and GDP to come up with their recession? I know it's backward looking, but many people are saying we're already in a recession because we've seen those two consecutive quarters. I know you have said, you know, maybe towards the turn of the year, maybe before, maybe after. What are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, um, contrary to popular opinion, economic is a science. It, it, you make, it's a social science. And over time, our knowledge increases. We, we increase the technolo technology and we're better able. We have better statistical techniques. We have more complete data. We, mm -hmm. we have the perspective of more bright minds looking at a problem. Um, and so the process goes forward. I mean, uh, let me just give you one little quick example. Um, when Adam Smith, the founder of economics, wrote The Wealth of Nations in 1776, he said price was determined by labor content. He didn't, didn't mention the utility of a guy item or the demand curve. That took William Stanley Jevons in 1870, and it wasn't until 1890 when Alfred Marshall put demand and supply together. Economics is an evolving science, so our information increases over time. And, and so, uh, and so our analytical capabilities increase. And what the NBER is saying is uh, in, by 2020, they had sufficient indication that the correct way to do it or the best way of doing it. And to keep in mind, there are problems uh, because things don't work smoothly. We were dealing with two different sets of data here. The more prudent thing to do is to average GDI and GDP. And that's what they're doing. And, and they made their case. And I, for one, buy what they say. Well, thanks for explaining L that. L Lacey, so look, we, we, we are in complete agreement and concert here that we see the 10-year treasury yield coming down and you know the relationship between mortgage rates and the 10-year treasury yield you know, means that mortgage rates, in our opinion, should follow suit and gain servicing value, head towards 5% as the 10-year gets towards three or a little under three. But there are some headwinds and those headwinds are interesting in that you have QT, right? So you have now um, less reinvestment from the Fed, and you also have a greater amount of debt that we've incurred that has to be absorbed by the marketplace. So there's more treasury supply coming to market. So what is your feelings around those two headwinds? Uh, 
and still seeing interest rates decline? Great, great question. And you're going to love the answer because I've heard you give the answer. And I know you had, I, you knew the answer before you asked me the question. The, the main determinant of the treasury rate is inflation, inflationary expectations. So if the inflation rate comes down, uh, the bond yield, and, and uh, I, I think that it's right now, it's, it's not just the treasury markets, the foreign currency markets, the commodity markets, they're all making the same statement, in my opinion. Um, the, the other factor is that on a short-term basis, demand and supply considerations do work. And the deficit is gonna get bigger because income's gonna fall off. We talked about a major decline in corporate profits. Uh, household income's gonna fall off. The safety net will be triggered. So we're gonna see a larger deficit. Um, but that always happens. Um, but but two, there, two buyers are gonna come in that have been sellers. Um, not only have the foreign sector been selling this year, but the, the commercial banks have been liquidating securities. I think every month since January or February, um, they, they cut another 10 or $12 billion out of their portfolio in the latest week. Um, uh, so uh, as uh, the, the economy weakens, the loans will fall off. A lot of the, a lot of the borrowing is because of distress, not because uh, that they're actively doing things that can help the economy. I think there's the corporate sector is having to borrow to firm up their cash flow and also to finance inventories. The household sector is borrowing to firm up their cash flow and meet their necessities. But, but we're going to see the loans fall off and the loan to deposit ratio is going to drop, which means that the banks uh, will go into governments. Now, it's very important to understand that. Um, loans have a different multiplier than investments in governments. Uh, loans have a high multiplier, uh, whereas uh, lending to the government by the banks uh, has a negative multiplier. The, there is no positive government expenditure multiplier. In fact, it's negative. Uh, and, and so as we tilt more to government financed activities, the, the overall multiplier will become weaker and weaker. And in my opinion, that will cause the velocity of money to decline, even though it's rising right now. Uh, and I, I think that what we're going to see is that, that monetary policy is really asymmetric. Uh, it, it can work when it's tightening, but when it, when it tries to move in the opposite direction, if they operate within the confines of what I would call lender of last resort role, uh, the, the role that was outlined for them under the Federal Reserve Acts, uh, monetary policy is going to be very feeble. Uh, there's an old expression that many people have heard, but they've forgotten. Um, you know, it, it, it's like pushing on a string. You can, you can bring a horse to the water, but you, you can't make him drink. And I think we're going to find that monetary policy will be far less effective unless, of course, they want to go off the charts again and, and take a high-risk gamble uh, with some sort of coordinated fiscal monetary policy operation that sends monetary growth through the, through the roof. And, you know, I, I don't know whether uh, the Federal Reserve would, would replay that mistake. I would hope that they would have learned, but it, it's clear that our people have not done well in inflation. They have been heavily damaged. Yeah, but and I, all, as, as you've written, Lacey, you know, in order to gain some jobs that would have normally come back anyway, maybe you accelerated those gains that probably would have come back. You put 180 million people in a worse off position. So you've written Absolutely. about that. So, um, you know, because I'm seeing some come, come off here. So I'm going to try and address a couple of things quickly. Housing, housing is local, folks. We all know that. In addition to that, let's remember, typically the fourth quarter is a slower time for housing anyway. So now you're seeing that. So don't get too hung up over that. When rates drop, you're going to unleash a horde of buyers in, the mar in markets. Most markets around the country have very tight inventory. So let's talk about that later on together. But here's the other thing that Lacey had just said, and I want to add to it as well. We're going to buy those because some of us are thinking about treasuries before that were offering 0.01%, which is no yield, to very <laughs> safe investments of 4 and a half to maybe after December uh, 14th rate hike, you may be around 5% in a very safe short-term investment. So we'll buy those. Also, those of us that see what Lacey is saying, smart money is looking at this and saying, wait a minute, I could get alpha, which means price appreciation, 
and a yield on longer term instruments. Hold on a second, I can get three and a half percent yield and the value of my bond will appreciate as yields drop, as inflation drops, we're gonna be the ones and others will see this as well and buy with both hands. And that should be enough to push yields lower. Hopefully, Lacey, you agree with that. Um, Absolutely, and I think that that's the, the message of my educational discussion here this morning. <laughs> or this afternoon. So I'm learning. So, um, so but Barry, so, you've learned long ago. <laughs> you and I have had we've had long, lengthy discussions. We've been good friends for almost two decades. Oh uh, well, we, Lacey, that, that, I feel like every, well, every time I talk to you, I feel like I'm going. I'm, I'm learning so much. Humble but, you would ask me to come on with you. I really am. It means a lot uh, to me. Thanks, Lacey. And the other thing, Lacey, is, and, and you know, maybe you don't want to go deep on oil, but you know, oil has been coming down, and certainly that helps to um, aid us in inflation. But the administration said that they will start purchasing to replenish the tr strategic petroleum reserve at a price of 70. And I've noticed that oil took a big dip even last night, and and I, don't, I haven't checked what it is, you know, lately this today, meaning lately, but it was around 74 or so. Are we approaching potentially a floor in oil? And does that mean that we get less help on the way down from oil? And if China really starts to kind of open up, would we see oil come up? And maybe that gives us a little inflationary headwinds? Okay. Uh, this is where we may have a little bit of any disagreement. Okay. Uh, when, when, when I look at inflation, I look at it from a big macro picture. I, I don't try to build an inflation forecast for the ground up. I try to look at what's happening to... Uh, aggregate demand, which is heavily influenced by money and velocity. And then I like to look at the aggregate supply curve, which we had no experience with to speak of when the pandemic hit. Uh, it was largely stable, it was largely shifting outward and it, it created problems for all of us. But uh, I, I think that the basic macro picture is toward lower inflation and how it works out among the individual sectors, uh, I can't tell you that. I, I don't know, but I, I think that the macro picture is consistent with lower inflation. Right. And being a Texan, I hope the oil price doesn't decline too far. But I <laughs> Great. I just wanted to ask maybe if, if Bill or Megan or Dan had anything here. We're right up on the top of the hour here, and I just want to see if you guys had anything you wanted to either ask Lacey or represent some of the thoughts from uh, from from our amazing, wonderful family of subscribers that are, uh, that, you know, Lacey, we had a well over a thousand people that uh, wanted to get on, but we only had a thousand people capacity. So, uh, so you, you had standing room only for you, Lacey, but uh, do you guys have any questions, Bill or Dan or Megan, before we wrap here? Sure. I have a question. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so uh, here at MBS Highway, you know, we've talked a lot about our fears of, you know, potentially the Fed uh, overdoing tightening. Um, would you say that uh, there is an oversized risk of them overdoing it, or are you more concerned that they would take their, you know, foot off too soon? Okay, um, I don't, I don't like to give the Fed a lot of advice, but um, my my feeling is that. Um, so I'm going to make a value judgment, which I shouldn't do. So I, if, if people don't like the value judgment, then disregard it. Um, because of, of, of the 20% the surge in, in ODL and money and liquidity in 20 and 21, they virtually guaranteed a bad outcome, two bad outcomes. So we've already had a major policy mistake by the Fed allowing inflation to get the momentum and, and although they said they are data dependent, when the inflation rate rose steadily above 2%, they didn't act. They waited and they waited and they waited, let the process go on. Okay, so um, they're now bringing it down. Uh, I do not know of a historical event in the Federal Reserve history, which goes back to 1913 in which a monetary deceleration of this magnitude has not produced a major downturn. I'm not saying it couldn't happen, but I don't know of any historical event. Um, so that's a bad outcome. That's a Hobson's choice. You don't, that's not a good outcome. The other possibility is that the, the Federal Reserve doesn't get there, just like 
Martin, Burns, Miller, and, and even Volcker for a while in 1980 didn't get them. And then they, then they allowed a perpetuation of the, of the money price wage spiral. So they're, they're caught here uh, with the, with the uh, other companion piece of this Hobson's choice, which is allowing the inflation rate to rise. But, the, but that doesn't work. Our, our people won't prosper. Uh, Warren Buffett had a great statement, which, which is uh, totally consistent with what I've been saying and what uh, Powell said, inflation swindles almost everyone. And, and I would add, inflation swindles the modest and moderate income households the most. And so uh, the Fed has two very bad choices. And um, we'll have to see which one they take. They appear to be uh, fully understanding that we cannot have true prosperity in a uh, adversarial inflationary relationship. Uh, but whether, whether they carry this out or not, that, that remains to be seen. But I, uh, I, I feel for the time being uh, that the course is clear. Uh, and so, Bill, thank you for that question. For those of you who don't know Bill, that was Bill, a great question, Bill, great question. Yeah. Bill, Bill is a brilliant member of our team. He's with us every morning behind the scenes on the update, helping us put that together. He gives the grades on the auctions that you get. Um, so I'm so glad that we got Bill some time here on on uh, on air, so to speak, because uh, he he is uh, a, a an incredibly important and valued member of well, our I team. I can second that based on his fantastic questions. <laughs> no, you're too kind you're too kind <laughs> so um megan you did such a great job as always bill dan and listen we want to thank all of you i saw something come up real quick about housing uh, remember housing as as we've talked about i know dan i actually brought it up on a recent update when you look at housing and you see housing recession that speaks to activity okay not prices there's two different aspects of it. remember always to there's housing the investment it's you know price of home and housing activity driver of gdp so we're looking at slower housing activity you that's to be expected with you know the jump up in rates people are hibernating a little bit more and not ready to jump in with a little sticker shock there uh, but that's housing activity price is a different story and can behave differently sometimes they behave the same sometimes they can behave differently so uh, we believe that housing activity and price will be supported as rates come down and people come out, although activity may still be constrained because lack of inventory. So, um, And also, 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 there will be an adverse effect from the job losses. There you go. Be there playing in the picture. I mean, it, 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 we're not going to have the same labor market uh, as we had. It, it's, as we discussed, and we're all in agreement, it, the labor markets are not what they seem, not by a long shot. Yes, yes. And most importantly, Lacey, um, I, don't, I don't even have words to thank you, not just for today, but for your wonderful friendship and your kindness and your willingness to share knowledge and teach all of us uh, how to better serve our customers and understand what's going on in the, in the, in the markets in a way that only you really can understand. So uh, not only will you, you, I'm you, indebted to you for having me understand. on and letting me uh, speak to your clients directly. You're a good friend, Barry. No, Hope you're a great friend for a long uh, time. <laughs> yes. Well, we, we love you, Lacey, and thank you and appreciate thank you. you everyone, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you.